Hi everyone, I'm Randy Aldridge, and I am very excited to have Dr. Cheryl Walker McGill here with us. She has produced a documentary about St. Agnes Hospital in Raleigh. And many of you may not have heard of this, so I'm really happy that she's gonna be sharing this with us. Um, so much to talk about. First of all, thank you for being here. So happy to be able to talk with you one-on-one -on -one about this film. Oh, thank you for asking me. It's called Someone Else's Shoes. It is. And I've seen it twice now, and both times, um, it's it's emotional to watch it, number one, but each time I think I got something different out of it. Um, I had a lot of questions, but first I want to talk about that, about you and, and your background. Now, you, you're, you're a doctor, physician, doctor. and married a physician, and, and so you've got a background in some of this. Tell us a little bit about yourself first. Okay, yeah, so I'm an internist and allergist immunologist. Um, I went to school at Duke, and that's where I went to medical school also, and then trained in North at Northwestern in Chicago and spent almost 20 years in Chicago. Um, married my husband in 2006, he was an orthodontist, mm -hmm. and lived in Charlotte, uh, you know, since then, until just the past couple of years when I now live in Wake Forest. So we're gonna talk about the film. First of all, um, how do you like the winters here versus Chicago? Um, <laughs> the winters here are much nicer. <laughs> Much nicer. So let's talk about the film. Okay. It uh, is uh, an examination of, of a part of North Carolina history that I don't think many people know about. And I want to start with what inspired you to even do this? You married a daughter of the and moved to North Carolina and all of a sudden decided, I want to make a film? Okay. No. <laughs> actually, it was uh, about two years ago uh, when my husband a little, uh, passed away unexpectedly in 2020. Mm -hmm. And I just felt the need to to do something that would get me out of my grief, to be honest. Mm. Um, and so I started to work on a book that he and I had planned to, uh, to write uh, about African-American contributions to medicine and dentistry in North Carolina. But I just found that writing the book was not my strong point. <laughs> um, and so I decided at that time, well, maybe I'll do just a short documentary. And I actually thought I'd do it for about uh, 10 minutes uh, and it turned out to be 24 minutes. And and it's a very impactful thing Thank that you. since I've seen it, I, I have a lot of questions for you, but I want to go with why did you end up focusing in on St. Agnes? Okay. Because I remember when I was in medical school reading about St. Agnes and the Leonard School of Medicine at Shaw University. Mm -hmm. I actually, even though I was in Durham, <laughs> and had not been to Raleigh at that mm -hmm. time. And... Uh, just had in my mind what it would look like I, uh, now. And so it was what, always going to what St. Agnes, Agnes would look, would look like. like. And yeah. so uh, what the building, the actual mm -hmm. facility would look like. And so uh, actually a friend of the family was taking uh, my mom and myself around the campus mm -hmm. because she, wanted, she was very proud of her school, St. Augustine's. And I just asked, oh, well, can you show me St. Agnes? And she was a little puzzled by the question, but she did. And then when I saw it, it was just very different than what I had imagined. I thought that it would either be an old administrative building or maybe just a plaque um, in its place, but it wasn't either of those. It's, um, it's still part of the building is there, uh, but it really appears to be ruins. And so I just it just caught my attention, um, and I felt like then... Like, you know, I've got to include this in this film that I'm going to do. The building spoke to you. The building spoke to me. Um, we talked about this a little bit before the interview started. I grew up here, and I knew zero about St. Agnes. So I think a lot of people will be shocked to hear about this. And I want to lead into, give me an overview of what this documentary is. Like, what you wanted to tell in the story? I wanted to tell the story of how, uh, even during difficult and challenging times in the late 1800s, how there were people who believed that they're in the access to care for all people. Um, the Episcopal Church actually helped to start the, to fund and start the hospital, but there were many people through the years who also contributed. I heard stories about how some of the founders actually took the, you know, went to the quarry right there and laid bricks, and some of them were former slaves. And I just thought, wow, what an, what an interesting and compelling story to see how people are able to unite um, in a community and work towards just increasing access to care. And I believe that we still, there's still opportunity for improving access to health care. 
I want to go to something you just mentioned in there, but, but, and that, that there's a lot of things to unpack with what you just said. But St. Agnes was built out of stone from the place where it is still. It's, yes. it's truly homegrown. Yes, it is truly homegrown. And it is, and in the film we talked about this, at, at one point, it was a very important medical center, for lack of a better way to put this, between New York and Atlanta. Like, yes. it was a big deal in its heyday. Well, they say between Atlanta and, and D.C., mm -hmm. That it was uh, one of a few, if not the most uh, well-equipped hospitals for black Americans. So and there were many facilities that actually would not admit black Americans at that time. And Leonard was a teaching school yeah. in St. Agnes as well, right? Uh, so the uh, so Leonard was a medical school, and it was actually the first four-year medical school in the nation. Uh, and so the graduates from Leonard Medical School would go to St. Agnes often to train. And when you said it was a leading medical center, I want to say that sounds like a great thing. But in the movie, you explained they didn't have screens on the windows. Right. Like That's the leading right. medical school for black Americans didn't well, have screens on the windows. That's, That's right. So the, the as we say, as often as said, the best equipped hospital between Atlanta and D.C. Uh, for black Americans did not have running water. It tells you just didn't have screens. They were functioning in very challenging situation, and you know, in very challenging, uh, in a challenging environment. But they still persevered. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and they treated people, and they were treating people who, in many ways, didn't have access to care, you know, otherwise. So, it definitely is a very positive uh, story to me, mm -hmm. um, and that's why I wanted to talk about it. And you said the word persevere. They persevered into the 60s. Yes. So there are still a lot of people here in North Carolina who can ride by and say, my parents, my grandparents were born there. They were treated there. So it's still living history for a lot of people. Yes. And that's a very amazing thing. Just when we were filming and there was a professor there who said everybody in his family had been born at St. Agnes except for him because he was born in 1961, <laughs> which is when they, when he clo when they closed. But I've met other people in uh, Raleigh who have said that they give the same story, that their families, many, many of their family members were born there. And so for some people in Raleigh, it has a very dear history. And then what's very interesting is that there are others who are in Raleigh, who've grown up in Raleigh, and they have not heard about St. Agnes. And you know, we have employees here at the Medical Society who had grandparents born there. I think it's amazing. Um, I, I, what was the most surprising thing you learned while you were doing this? I think the surprising thing for me is that it closed right at the time of the civil rights movement. And at a time when you would think that perhaps it would be stronger and uh, supported uh, and you know maybe survive until now, it actually closed. And there were many reasons for that. Uh, one of which is just that the support et cetera, was going to, you know, Wake Med, I think it was developed around that time. And so there was a lot of support for that. Uh, so that that's one thing. But probably the biggest surprise for me is just that there's still the ruins there. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's purpose in that. And maybe the purpose is to think about what can that property be in the future? How can that property serve the community? Um, and so I, I actually didn't start with that, uh, but, I, but I believe that, uh, I believe in the reimagination of things. Yeah, which I, having seen the movie now, I can't imagine how those will not be reimagined for, for future generations. Um, uh, just fun fact, what's the craziest thing you learned in doing all of this? Um, that uh, when you decide to to make a film, uh, you have to learn how to do it. That yes, <laughs> that uh, uh, you. Uh, I've always believed actually that you don't have to be the person with all the knowledge to do something. You just have a, have to have a great team, and so I had a great team, um, and and I believe that going forward, that uh, it takes people who who just sort of share your vision for something. Uh, that can help make it happen. And so, you know, maybe one of the craziest things was when people were asking me for the script. And I'll admit, I didn't even realize that I needed a script. 
I just thought that I would just interview people and uh, the editor um, and producers would put it all together. And so, but when they, you know, when I started being asked about a script, that's when I went to work on it. And so that's probably the, the craziest thing. <laughs> we had a great team, but you had a great dream. And now it's realized. How does that make you feel? It makes me um, feel, I have to say, I, um, I'm touched by what you just said. Um, so it makes me feel that I uh, have purpose in doing this. And uh, I think that that's just, uh, that's, that's an enormous um, honor. So I see it more just, uh, it's really been my pleasure and honor. And I've learned a lot of things uh, you know, with this. And I've just also learned how to open up more to people because, you know, a few years ago, I never would have talked to someone about my personal journey. I would have talked to them till their ears fell off about medicine, <laughs> um, but never really about my personal journey. But I just, I, I'm in a different place. And I don't know it. I think that I've gotten as much out of doing the story as maybe some people have by watching the film. What do you think your husband would have to say about this? Well, I think he would be really proud. Um, my husband, Paul, was supportive of so many things. I, Dr. Paul McGill. Dr. Paul A. McGill, Paul mm -hmm. Arnold McGill. He was the first black orthodontist in Charlotte Mecklenburg. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just, he did so many things with his life. And we always, when we got married, we worked on lots of things together in the community. And so I think that he would be very, very pleased. Um, I think that uh, just recently having gone up to the National Institute of Oral Health and Craniofacial Research at uh, NIH uh, to talk about the film and show some of the trailers, which included the trailer about the three trailblazers, uh, and to talk just how can, we, how can we integrate oral health more into medicine? What can we do to make things better for people? And for that to be at his institute, I just, I think he would be very, very pleased. I think he'd be very, very proud as well. And very proud. I have a couple more questions for you, and, and then I'll let you go. I know that this is out of your comfort zone, but I'm, I just, there's so much I want to learn. But I, I guess when I uh, ever talk to anybody who does a passion project like this, I always want to know when you start it, what did you want people to get out of it at the end? And, and did that change throughout the process? Okay. So I will admit that when I started this, I really didn't envision showing it. I did it as a personal project, um, and I thought initially I wasn't going to show it at all. And then I thought, oh well, maybe we'll show it to a few high schools, uh, maybe to you know college students at Saint Aug, and maybe a couple other places. But uh, but really didn't think beyond that. And in fact, was asked by one of the producers uh, to review a marketing plan, and I refused. I said I do not plan to market. I do not plan to show it to anyone besides maybe a few students here and there. Um, and, and it's amazing, right? It's yeah, about, it shows you how and here we are. Our, yeah, and and how we are. So yes, and so I forgot. Let's try this one. I tell me what the second part of the question was. What do you hope people get out of watching it? What do you hope they feel at yeah. the end? I hope actually that they it will inspire them to maybe pay attention to the communities that they may walk through every day and to realize that there are people, we, we really do have a wonderful country and we have, I believe in the beauty of our state of North Carolina and we just, there, there is a lot of, I believe in the power of multicultural communities um, and so I think paying attention maybe to the people that we pass by or the communities we may pass by on a regular basis is good. But I also think that thinking about how, how everyone can sort of contribute to the better of a community um, is good. And I, you know, and then I'd have to say on a personal level to not be afraid to, to try new things um, and, you know, I've done some work with uh, um, physician wellness. Uh, we had a roundtable discussion when I was at the medical board, on the medical board a few years ago about it, and have written an article. And so, 
you know, so I really believe that there's a lot of room for improvement in, in physicians and other healthcare providers. And I guess maybe one of the things that I believe is just that there are times when you may feel that you're in a valley and you just can't get out of it, but to realize that actually you can. And you, if you make sure that the people who are around you are supportive and loving, and I've been blessed really to have that, both with uh, you know some family members, but friends and, and colleagues. Um, and so to just realize that you can help to put together a community, personal community, that will help you get beyond that. And there's so much more that you can do for, for, for society, and it will make you feel better. Okay, I promise I only have two more questions, I promise. But um, I want to say something, in, in a lot of things you've said today, you've talked about pathways, walking, journeys, and then title is someone else's shoes. Yes. Explain that link to us. Okay. Well, I always feel that wherever, whatever path you walk, you're able to do that because of the people who came before you. And for me, when I think about the people who came before me, I think about my grandmother. And when I was a little girl, she used to talk about growing up in South Carolina, and there were times when she didn't have shoes. And that was a very difficult thing for me to imagine when I was a child. But the story stayed with me. And it just showed me that my grandmother went through so much more than what I've gone through. Um, I have way more advantages, resources. Um, and so I've just always been, you know, shoes have meant something to me. I've always had shoes, never had to live the life that she lived at that point. Um, and I just think that, you know, if I can uh, maybe help to pave a path, make a path a little easier for someone else, that's how I came up with the title. Going to leave that trail for somebody else to follow. Yeah. Let's talk about where that trail is going next. What's next for you? What's on the horizon? Okay. Well, I'm happy to say that uh, I we have developed a think tank. Um, and that comes from, that's inspired by talking with the lots of folks that we talk to with the creation of this film. It was actually always a dream of mine to be on a think tank. But I like to tell people why I never got the invitation um, and so I decided with just all the exposure and uh, to just incredible and wise people that this would be a good time to, to start one here in North Carolina. And we have started it. Our first uh, our round table is going to be here at the Medical Society uh, this summer, and it will be on AI and healthcare. So you are not taking a path. You are creating the trail. Yes, very good. Very, very, very good. Thank you so much for talking to us. Now, everybody, you can watch this. You are putting it out there for people to see yes. when they want. You have a long list, but to get on that list and find out more, it is called Pearls2, the number purpose.com. Yes. Right? So it's Pearls, P E A R L Z, to the number two purpose.com. Perfect. And we have all this information here for you. Please watch this. I know that you will answer questions for other people. You're so interesting. This journey that you're on is so inspiring. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for watching. And make sure you check out Someone Else's Shoes.